Well, we do welcome uh, all of you here today, as well as those of you who are joining us online. And it's so good to celebrate Christmas in this way with all of you. Now, uh, you should know that I received a lot of pressure to wear a, a Christmas seat, uh, suit today. And I, the, the, I wore one last year, um, but I told them that um, it was important that while I speak, you're able to listen and concentrate on what I'm saying and that you would laugh with me and not at me. Um, and so, because I'm a team player, I, I did compromise, and uh, this is what I decided to wear of what was left of that suit. So, um, I hope it doesn't distract you too much uh, while I speak. You know, I do love the Christmas season uh, for many reasons, but one of them is people just seem friendlier this time of the year. Do you notice that? Maybe you haven't noticed that. I, I notice that a lot. Uh, even people who look like their passport picture most of the time, um, you know, they just seem to lighten up more this time of the year. You know, the Bible reminds us uh, that a cheerful heart is good like medicine. Uh, if you're one of those who fights smiling and laughing, just remember, Jeff Allen says this, if you suppress your laughter, it goes back down and spreads your hips. So just keep that in mind. So laugh hard and laugh often, my friend. Now, as I said, for many people, Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year. Uh, the thought of being home for Christmas with family, uh, together with friends, uh, having good conversations, good food, and laughs, opening gifts, reflecting on the events of the past year, gives them much joy and anticipation. But for others, Christmas is anything but joyful. Uh, for some of you, the thought of being home for Christmas just makes your heart grow cold. Uh, because home is, a, is the place that you face constant rejection and hurt. And for others of you, Christmas will be especially hard and, and bring times of loneliness and sadness because a loved one um, that meant the world to you uh, has died. Or, or because of a relational breakup or heartbreaking disappointment or life-changing medical diagnosis or some other reason that is hard for you to even articulate. George Gallup Jr., concluded from his research studies that North Americans are among the loneliest people in the world. Three out of four people in the Western world uh, indicate that they are lonely. And this seems unbelievable when, when you think about the fact that we are living closer together um, than, than we ever have in terms of our cities and so forth. And that we're also in the most technologically connected age in the history of civilization. And yet, loneliness is a growing reality. The rates of loneliness have more than doubled over the last 30 years, which is concerning for many reasons, one of which is that loneliness appears to be taking a real toll on our health. A few years ago, the Globe and Mail referenced several medical research uh, studies which clearly showed that loneliness actually makes people sicker. In one study, for example, they found that people with uh, stronger relational connections uh, were less susceptible to getting colds and produced significantly less mucus than people who were relationally unconnected. Someone summarized that study this way, people without friends are snottier than people <laughs> with friends. In another study, a social scientist at Harvard University uh, found that people who have poor health habits like eating mostly junk food, let's say, but had strong relational connections, lived significantly longer than people who had great health habits, but lived a more isolated life. One pastor summarized that study this way, it's better to eat Twinkies with friends than broccoli alone. <laughs> so, now most of us believe that if our circumstances were different, we wouldn't be lonely. People have told me that they feel very much alone because they constantly feel unloved, unwanted by their spouse, or perhaps by their parent or a sibling, uh, or by a child. Others attribute their loneliness to not having found a life partner yet. 
One unmarried individual wrote this, I can't think of anything else besides evil that I hate as much as I hate being alone. I turn on the television and I see couples. I walk down the street and I see a mother and her child. The reminders that I am alone are endless. Sometimes I wonder, how long do I need to live like this? Will I ever find someone to replace the hole in my heart? Some of us link, um, some people link their loneliness to the opposition, the criticism, and the attacks of others. Pastor Ben Patterson says, many of us in leadership have felt the loneliness that comes with leadership. When you give your life to something, and in the end, people slam you, they question your motives, they, they leave you standing there all alone, holding nothing but the charred memories of your dreams and your efforts. I'm sure that many of us can identify with the loneliness that often accompanies um, one or more of these that I've just mentioned. And the belief that we wouldn't be lonely if it weren't circumstances like these. But here's the thing. While I've met with people facing difficult circumstances who felt very much alone, I've also talked with other people facing the best of circumstances and yet have said to me that there are moments when they too feel very much alone. I've met people who, by most standards, have everything that a person could want. And yet, even though they have it all and are surrounded by people who love and care for them, they've confided that in the quieter moments of life, sometimes, many times in the middle of the night, a deep loneliness often steals over their soul. You see, there is an aloneness that is so deep that no human being can ever take it away. Now, philosophers tell us the reason that we're lonely at the core of our being is because we long for meaning, and unfortunately, we live in a meaningless world. A few years ago, Dr. Richard Dawkins, an atheist and former professor of evolutionary biology at Oxford University, he wrote this, the reason that we're lonely is that the universe offers no design, no purpose, no hope. Just blind, pitiless indifference. Now, that is just rather depressing, isn't it? But you know what? If there is no God, and if there is no God who created us, then Dawkins, Dawkins is absolutely right. There is no purpose in their life if there is no God. We are simply a product of chance and therefore are alone in a cold and indifferent universe with no meaning or hope in life. Merry Xmas. But you see, the Bible and the Christmas story tells us that this is not the way it is. Unlike the atheist story, which believes there is no God and therefore no purpose or hope in this life, the Christian story or the Christmas story begins with a conviction that there is a God, that he is knowable. And folks, that makes all the difference. You see, the Christmas story begins long before Jesus came to earth as a baby in Bethlehem. The Christmas story begins with God. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the Bible doesn't make a case for why God exists. It simply declares that God is. Before there was a beginning, God existed. He has always existed. He is the creator of the universe, and he sustains the universe. He holds it all together. We find the creation story in Genesis 1. And in verse 26, it says this. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Now, notice God did not say, let me make man in my image. No, he said, let us make mankind in our image. 
God is referring to himself in the plural here as more than one person. And this is referring actually to the three persons of the Godhead or the Holy Trinity, consisting of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Now I point that out to you because God has never been by himself. In other words, he has never been alone. God has always been a community of three persons, the Father, Son, and Spirit. These three persons have all the attributes of God in the sense that they're all powerful, they're all knowing, they're everywhere present, and they are totally one in every way. Furthermore, these three persons of the Godhead exist together in unceasing state of perfect love, joy, and delight. Think of the best times that you've had with families and fr family and friends. Your richest conversations and experiences. Those moments when you did not feel alone, but felt loved, accepted, and included, and you found yourself thinking, man, it just doesn't get any better than this. That is but a small reflection of how much the Father, Son, and Spirit love and enjoy each other. This is where the Christmas story begins. Now, Genesis 1.26 says this as well. It says that we are made in the image, the likeness of God. Now, that means a number of things, but one of the things it means is that God wired us up not to be alone. He wired us up he imprinted in us a deep desire to be in relationship with him and also with others. Which explains why we have this powerful yearning within us for home. And by home, I'm talking about to be in authentic relationships where we are loved and accepted unconditionally, where we're genuinely forgiven for our, our, our sins and mistakes, and we know that we belong and that we matter. Now, when God created our first parents, Adam and Eve, they experienced home the way that God intended us to. They had a loving, transparent relationship with God, and they had an intimate, open, and a healthy relationship with each other. And God could have ensured that that particular sense of home that they experienced stay that way permanently by programming Adam and Eve to obey his every command perfectly. But thankfully, God didn't want robots. He didn't want puppets. He wanted lovers. In other words... In the same way that we instinctively want our spouse or members of our family or close friends to love us freely from the heart instead of from a sense of duty and obligation, so God wants us to love him freely from the heart, which is why he gifted us with the freedom to make choices. However, in giving us the freedom to make choices, God risked the possibility of us spurning his love and going our own way and making not only good choices, but also evil, self-centered decisions. And in Genesis 3, we read that Adam and Eve did just that. They decided to leave home, as it were, to go off and do things their way rather than God's way, which, by the way, all of us, ever since then, all of humanity, including us, have done the same thing. We've all gone our own way, rather than God's way. So let's not be too hard on them. And when they left home, their relationship with God and each other was fractured. And the loving community they were experiencing began to unravel. They didn't die physically that day, but they did die spiritually. In other words, they were now spiritually separated from God, leaving a hole, 
leaving a spiritual vacuum deep inside of them. And consequently, from that time on, we now live in a broken world in which evil and sadness exists. We live in a broken world with broken people who are spiritually separated from God and who, despite the best of circumstances, are lonely in the deepest part of their soul. Even though most people are unable to explain why, why we have this hole in our heart, this ache of loneliness within, we're desperately trying to fill it. Our hurriedness, our busyness, our striving, our obsession with pleasing people is really an attempt to fill that hole within us, to satiate our longing, to love and to be accepted and, and to belong. And to hear someone say, you know, you matter to me. Our civilized, our, our culture's preoccupation with sex, if you think about it, grows out of our loneliness and deep longing for intimacy, for that feeling, even though temporary, that I am wanted, that I am desirable, that I matter, I'm special to someone. Eric Weiner, a popular speaker and author, he explores his spiritual restlessness in his New York Times best-selling book entitled Man Seeks God. And he writes this. The 17th century French philosopher Blaise Pascal coined the term God-shaped hole to describe this yawning void that is the human condition. And then he goes on to write, over the years, I've attempted to fill my God-shaped hole with all manner of stuff, with food, with sex, success, more food, travel, drugs, books, more food. But nothing filled that void. You see, this is the human condition. And this is why Jesus came. And why we celebrate Christmas, not only at this time of year, but really every day of the year. There are many reasons Jesus came, but I want to point out two for us to reflect on and to apply to our lives. First of all, Jesus came to make a way for us to become a friend of God. God knows that that hole in our heart, that deep sense of loneliness, can only be filled by us coming back to him. You see, in the same way that our hunger tells us that we were made to eat, and that our thirst indicates that we were made to drink, so our loneliness tells us we were made for God and to be with God. The reality is even the best human life is ultimately disappointing. Comedian Jim Carrey, he was speaking from personal experience when he said, you know, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see it's not the answer. He was expressing frustration, his own frustration when he made that comment. And he couldn't articulate the reason for it but he was referring to the whole, to the restlessness inside. Life ultimately disappoints us at the deepest level, not only because we leave it all behind, but also because we were made for so much more. Ecclesiastes 3.11 puts it this way, God has set eternity in our hearts. University of Oxford professor and author C.S. Lewis, he explained our longing for God and for the eternal things of God this way. He wrote, If I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. In other words, we were made by God and to be with God. 
And we will continue to be lonely and restless until we come home to him and find our rest in him. And that is why ever since Adam and Eve turned their back on God and left home, God has been pursuing us to come back home to himself. And in the fullness of time, God did the unthinkable. He made the ultimate sacrifice by sending his only son, Jesus, to become one with us, taking on human flesh and moving into our neighborhood, as it were, living among us and then ultimately dying on a cruel cross in our place to make a way for us to come home and become a friend of God. My question is, have you made the decision to come home and to become a friend of God? I'll give you an opportunity to do that in just a few moments. The first reason Jesus came was to make a way for us to become a friend of God. The second reason he came was to be with us. You know, the most frequent promise in the Bible is not, I will forgive you, even though that is found often in the Scripture. Neither is the promise of eternal life the most frequent promise in the Scripture. No, the most frequent promise we find in Scripture is, I will be with you. All the way through the Bible, God regularly tells his people, I'll be with you. Do not fear, I'll be with you. Go and trust me, I will be with you. 700 years before Jesus came to our planet, the prophet Isaiah He foretold his coming, and he wrote this. The Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and he will and will call him Emmanuel. The word Emmanuel is a Hebrew name which literally means God with us. Not God above us, not God all around us, but God with us. And when Jesus ascended to heaven after his resurrection, he gave us this promise. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. When you put your trust in Jesus and you invite him to be part of your life on a daily basis, you can know that no matter what you face or how alone you may feel, he is with you and will never leave you or forsake you. King David wrote in Psalm 23, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you, Lord, are with me. Now, to be clear, God does not promise us happy endings in a world that is broken and, and really full of evil, or that we will not face hardships uh, or be kept safe from hurt and harm. What God promises us is that he is with us, that he will walk with us through the valley. Now, I know this promise may sound rather hollow for those who are going through a dark valley right now, who are kind of hanging on by a thread and feeling like their life is spinning out of control. But I can tell you from my own experience that God is true to his promise. When I was 12, our family totally unraveled. And fear and insecurity about my future and the well-being of my two younger sisters at times just overwhelmed me. When I was 22 and just newly married, my doctor informed me I had a serious form of cancer. And then when I was 32 and now a father of four young boys and senior pastor of Center Street Church, I received the dreaded news that the cancer had returned. And as many of you know, after 30 years of excellent health, I recently received the news that I have cancer again. 
And during each of these defining events in my life, I experienced all the human emotions that people do when faced with the potentially life-altering and life-threatening news. And with each trial, I distinctly remember moments when I, I felt all alone. And it sure wasn't because there weren't hundreds and hundreds of people who were praying and supporting and loving on us. Even though I had all the love and support that I could ever dream of, I realized that there was no one, not even my loving wife, who would be able to walk with me through the valley of the shadow of death. No one. No one but my Lord. And it's hard for me to explain what a blessing it is and it has been to know that he's as real as I'm standing here and to sense his presence with me in those moments when I feel all alone in the valley. During every trial as I reached out to him, he was with me even as he is now. I received a peace I received spiritual strength and encouragement from him that surpasses all human understanding. And frankly, I can't imagine going through life, much less the valleys, without him. And folks, the hard reality is if you've ignored God, if, if you're ignoring him, or if you're keeping him at a safe, comfortable distance, or if, if you're making God in your own image, in other words, you're putting God together the way you'd like God to be, the way the children put together Lego, I just want to remind you, in as gentle a way as I can, that when you go through the valley, and you will go through the valley, you're going to be going through the valley alone. I don't know what dark valley you're walking through right now, but you need not go through it alone. You may be facing a difficult medical diagnosis, but you need not face it alone. You may be facing unemployment, loss of business, or income, but you need not face it alone. You may be facing marital struggles, but you need not face them alone. You may be facing a heartbreaking loss, but you need not face it alone. Jesus became one with us. He died for us so that he could be with us even in the darkest valleys. But friends, he's, he's a gentleman. And he won't go where he's not wanted. We need to reach out to him. We need to put our trust in him and invite him to be with us. The truth is this. You can go through life and the valleys of life with God or without God. What I can tell you from the scriptures and also from my own personal experience, if you embrace Jesus by faith, you choose life, you choose hope, you choose peace. If you go it alone, you choose emptiness, purposelessness, despair, loneliness. There is nothing in between. It's either God or despair. Choose. And you know, even when I'm in the darkest of the valleys, and I don't know how it's all going to turn out, I know the God. I know the God who will work it out for my ultimate good and for his ultimate glory. And that is enough. Amen. 
I'll close with this. Philip Yancey tells about a father who was battling with his 15-year-old daughter. Even though she refused to admit it, she was in a very unhealthy, abusive relationship. He knew she was using birth control. Several nights, she never came home at all. And the parents had tried everything but to no avail. Their daughter lied to them, deceived them, and found ways to turn the tables on them, blaming her rebellion on their failure as a mom and dad. And then she stormed out of the house and left once again. The father said this to Yancey. I remember standing before the plate glass window in our living room, staring out into the darkness, agonizing for her safety and her well-being and just wanting her desperately to come home. He said, I felt such rage. I was furious with my daughter for the way that she would manipulate us and twist the knife to hurt us. But then his eyes began to fill up with tears and he went on to say, but you know, when my daughter came home the next morning, I wanted nothing in the world so much as to take her into my arms. And to tell her how much I loved her. I was a helpless, lovesick father. And friends, I'm here to tell you that there is a father, our heavenly father, who loves you like that and more. And he's extending his arms out to you. And regardless of your past and your regrets, he's calling out to you to come home where you're loved and accepted, where you belong, and where you matter apart from your performance. And here's the thing. Your closest friend does not sit in this room. In fact, your closest friend doesn't even live on this planet. Your closest friend, whether you realize it or not, is Jesus. He knows your name. And he loves you more than you'll ever know. He died for you, even as he did for me. And he's closer than you think. He's done everything possible for you to be in relationship with him. But you know, you, you, you can know everything I've just shared. In fact, you could say, I, I believe it all. But if you don't respond, if you don't take a step of faith, all it is is knowledge. Nothing changes. And so the ball is in your court. Will you say yes to him? Will you step out and embrace him by faith? Will today be the day you come home and say, I want to begin a friendship with you, Jesus. Starting a friendship with Jesus begins by you just telling him your desire, and you can do that through prayer. And so I want to help you with that. I'm just going to say a simple prayer, not unlike the prayer I prayed years ago that changed my heart and the trajectory of my future forever. And I'm going to invite you to come along, and I'm going to invite you to pray it with me. So would you bow your heads for just a moment? I just want to remind you that God knows your thoughts. So don't feel that you have to pray out loud. Don't let that, excuse me, be the barrier. By all means, pray out loud if you want to or you feel you should. The important thing is, is that you pray it sincerely from the heart because that's what God sees. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me and for accepting me. Thank you for making a way for me to come home through Jesus. I acknowledge that I have ignored and defied you in so many ways. 
There's something broken in me, I guess it's called sin, and I can't fix it. I need your gift of grace, oh God. So please come into my life and make me the person you want me to be. I want to come home, Lord. I want to be your friend, and I never want to be alone again. I want to engage in the faith adventure that you have marked out for me. Guide me, Lord. Transform me. Use my life to bring hope where there is despair, to bring love where there is apathy and peace where there's turmoil. I love you, Lord. I trust you. And I intend to follow you wherever you lead. For I pray it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now, God knows your heart. If you have sincerely prayed that prayer, on his behalf, I just want to say, welcome home. And I can say that because the Bible says that in the spiritual realm, a miracle has taken a place. That little step of faith you took is the first step. It's the most important step. The Bible says you are now a new creation in Christ. The old, the regrets, all that stuff is gone. The new has come. Because you asked him in faith, Jesus has invaded your life, and he will increasingly... As you allow him to, as you open more of your life to him, he will increasingly live his life of love, joy, and peace through you. I challenge you to let someone know of your faith decision, perhaps the person you came with. We have a kind of a booth or something out there in the atrium that says, I said yes. There's some people there that would love to talk with you, pray with you, answer questions, and of course to hear you share this good news. Let someone know. It doesn't mean much if you're not willing to let someone know. Just thought I'd mention that. Now undoubtedly, you have many more questions. And we just want to be available to help you find answers, to encourage you in any way that we can. And so I'd I'm going to ask you to do something I ask pretty much every year. When you came in, you received uh, a bulletin like this. It says Merry Christmas on the front. And if you open it up, you'll see there's a place for you to write down a prayer request that you might have for yourself or someone that's close to you. And then if you open it up, on the other side, there is another little side that says my response. Please give us your name and your phone number. And then check any of the boxes that are true for you or there's a place for other, other things that let us know about the decisions you made today. If you prayed that prayer with me, if you said yes to Jesus, please let us know. We simply want to walk with you. We promise not to hound you. You'll get a contact. You'll get contacted by us. But it's only an invitation to enter into community and to allow us the opportunity to walk with you in this new faith adventure that you are embarking upon with Jesus. Now, you may still have lots of questions about the Christian faith. You may be wondering about questions like, why, why, why believe that God exists? Why believe, that, why believe in Jesus? Why believe that Jesus is the only way to God? What about suffering? Why does a loving God allow suffering? All those kind of questions that plague us. This Why Believe series attempts to answer those questions. It begins January 16th. I want to encourage you to sign up for that and be part of that. And so I'm hoping that you've all taken out this little card. And while you're filling this card out, we're going to be blessed by a closing song called All Is Well which speaks to the peace that filled the atmosphere around the dark and that smelly cave in Bethlehem in which Christ was born. But it also speaks to God's passionate desire that we would experience His peace, His shalom in every aspect of our lives, including our relationship with Him and with one another. And so as we listen and as you listen to this song, Ask 
the Lord this question. Lord, is all well between you and me? And Lord, is all well between me and others? And whatever you sense him bring to your mind, talk to him about that and what he would have you do.